is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21. Be very careful then how you will live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The word of the Lord. Uh, Thank you, Heather. And good morning once again to Redeemer Lincoln Square. We are are glad that you are here. This summer, I was able to um, watch a more than one movie, but there was a particular movie that I, that I enjoyed. It was the semi-autobiographical movie, The Fablemans, about Steven Spielberg's life as he, as he grew up. And there's this one particular scene where, as a teenager, he's moved to California, and he's Jewish, and he likes this Christian girl, and he uh, you know, wants to get closer to her, and so... Um, there's all these funny scenes where this Christian girl is trying to funny things, but at worst they're disingenuous and maybe even and dangerous. At the same time, concurrently, there is a, what does it mean about, uh, you know, how I actually grow and how do I know I've done enough and how do I know if, I've, if I know enough? And so while there's some Christians out out there who are trying to make you inhale the Holy Spirit, there are other Christians who, because of the lack of formation, they just want to hide their faith because they don't know how they can interact with culture. They don't know how to be present, to be in the world but not of it. They don't know how to do it. And so both these problems, I believe, are addressed in our text today from Paul's letter to the Ephesians We're wrapping up our series on the Holy Spirit, and we're going to do that by looking at what Paul says is the, um, what it means about having the Holy Spirit, how to live and how to grow. And it's keys in on this key phrase, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's summarized in that one phrase, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, you should ask if um, you're like me, you say, well, what does that actually mean? Does that mean you are inhaling something? Does that mean that we're, we're drinking something? So let's break this text down into three parts. Let's look at what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what is produced in a person who is filled with the Holy Spirit, and then how you can have it. I'll say it again. What, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what is produced in someone who has the Holy Spirit, and then, lastly, uh, how do we get it? So first, what does it mean? And before we begin, we, we need to see that Paul tells us what it doesn't mean. If you go to the text, r- right before it says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, there's this one little word. It says the word instead. instead. Instead of what? That's a contrast. And the instead is instead, do not be filled with wine and being drunk. Now, a lot of us, when you read that the first time, you kind of just sort of pass right by it because you say to yourself, well, I don't have a drinking problem. This isn't my problem. So not a big deal. But if you did that, that would be a mistake because Paul is trying to give you a surprising contrast here. That's, there's, there must be something about being filled with the Holy Spirit that can be confused with being drunk and being giddy and, being, and something about drinking and wine and stuff and the effects of that seem similar or, and or dissimilar with being filled with the Holy Spirit and we're meant to say what that might be. Well, I... I I put down at least three different contrasts of what this looks like. There's three contrasts because um, we, ac- we actually have a historical example where this actually happens. If you go to Acts chapter 2, in Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes down the, on the disciples, the disciples began talking and being direct and fearless and yet having this joy and this contentment and this peace. And it was such a combination of traits that for the people that were hearing them, to them it looked like the only way that you could have that is in a state of drunkenness. That there's something about being giddy and uninhibited and direct 
that in their minds only drunk people could have. And so what is the contrast? Well, I think we see three things here. One, being filled with the Spirit means joy. Martin Lloyd-Jones, famous British minister, he was actually a medical doctor before he became a pastor. And he points out that alcohol is actually a medical depressant. And what it does is the more you drink it, the more you're unable to understand and, and, and get reality, but that makes you giddy, that makes you feel happy. And what's, what he points out is, is that by seeing less of reality, that's why you feel happier. But in contrast, Paul's trying to say that the Spirit actually shows you more reality. The Spirit shows you more about yourself and your needs and your issues, and yet also... Jesus' love and care. And because you can hold on to both those things, that's the reason why you get joy. Because as you see reality that despite your failures and problems and issues, his love stays, the combination of those things brings joy. And so look at the contrast here. Filled with drunkenness brings joy as you're less aware of your problems, but filled with the Spirit brings joy as you're more aware of your problems. Because you know that despite those issues, your standing, your everlasting standing, your assurance of life and love and grace is real. And I think the reason why people did do drugs and why they drink, in my experience, the re- reason why people want to do that is because in some level you want to escape reality. It's the same reason, by the way, why we go into entertainment, why we put on Netflix. At some level, we are trying in those moments to say, I want to get away from my normal life. Why? Because reality's hard. Reality's difficult. And when you're sad and when you're anxious, it takes away our joy. And yet Paul has the audacity to say that there's something about being filled with the Spirit that, that despite the sadness and anxiety, it actually can bring more joy in the Spirit. That's what you have here, number one. Okay, number two, inhibitions. Also, we know alcohol works by making you more direct and more courageous. How? Because it lessens your inhibitions. The reason why people are able to take the risks that they take is because they've lost the inhibitions they normally would have had. And yet Paul says in this word, instead, instead the Spirit heightens awareness of a lot of things. For instance, The Spirit heightens your awareness of your final destination. Why does that matter? Why would that make you more courageous and bold? Because, think, if death doesn't have the last say on your life, if you experience a love and a care that changes your life, and we know somehow that all that we've lost, all the people we've lost, all the things we lost, we know we will see again. And real beauty never really dies. And death is but a sleep. Those truths held intimately in our souls gives us a boldness and ability to make it through life and pushes us to want to care for other people's lives and let them know about it. But it wouldn't, by the way, this care, would, this boldness wouldn't be brashness. It wouldn't be, you know, let me try to make you inhale the Holy Spirit. It would manifest in curiosity. It would manifest in a, a change in our posture. Here's what happens normally. When somebody hurts you, here's what happens. When somebody really, really hurts you, that what my natural inclination is to say, how dare they? How could they? And you focus on you hurt, your hurt, and you focus on how to get back from them what they took from you. But with this posture, knowing the final destination, knowing what's going to happen, you can have more curiosity and say, you know what, that, that really did hurt, but why did they do that? What needs are they manifesting because they just did what they did to me? And you can become more, as you become more aware, you, you can actually be able to meet those needs because of this boldness. All right, last contrast, control. Under heavy influence of alcohol, you lose control. Scientifically, I think, I, I don't quite remember my high school uh, biology, but I think alcohol ch- like changes in your cells, like the, the, the I think it's the uh, pathway to get, you know, get, potassium in the cells or something like that and turn sideways. Scientifically, the more alcohol you drink, the less control of your faculties that you have. You drink enough and you lose the control of walking and seeing. And yet, this is saying that under a heavy influence of the Holy Spirit, you don't lose control, you gain it. Why? The Holy Spirit gives you control 
over how you're going to respond to the circumstances of life as you have this larger kingdom mentality. I did a retreat, this is uh, years ago when I was in Boston, the church I was serving with, we, um, we brought in uh, Joni Erickson Tata. And um, she, decades ago, had a, a major accident where she's been paralyzed from the neck down. And so now she does retreats and speaks at conferences. And I remember, I still remember, I was just new in ministry. I was in my, tw- in my 20s. And she pulled me aside because after the re- weekend, we had gotten close enough, and she pulled me aside and said, Michael, you don't need to feel sorry for me. You don't need to keep kind of pandering and making sure I'm okay and making sure I'm feeling okay because you know what? I know I'm going to be able to ride horses again. I know I'm going to be able to dance again. I know I'm going to be able to, to walk again because the Christian view of the kingdom is that this world isn't just going to, you know, disappear, that the future reality, she says, is I'm, I'm going to have a renewed spinal cord and I'll be able to walk again. And when you know that all good things ultimately are going to last and all bad things will turn out for good and the best is yet to come, when you have that succinct view of reality, it lets us know how to respond. It brings control to how we respond to the world in the here and now. We said when we started this series, if you go to John chapter 16, what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit's main function and job is to make Christ more real to you. Which means then for Paul in our text, if he's saying, be filled with the Holy Spirit, he's basically saying, be filled with Christ. And all that Christ did and is doing and will do in your life, and when that happens, when that becomes so real and so evident in your heart, not just an intellectual concept that often Christians walk around intellectually believing something, but not letting it affect your heart, but when it actually moves into the heart, What will end up happening is your life will ooze this joy and this confidence and this boldness and this control and this contentment as it becomes the center of your reality. And so we must ask, before we move on, this is what I want us to ask. Is this evident in our lives? Right? When you do a little introspection, is this evident? If you are not a Christian here, something is at the center of your life. It's functioning that way. It's the motivating factor for why you get up in the morning. And you need to ask yourself, is that that enough? You know, be intellectually honest with yourself and ask yourself, is that enough? But if you are a Christian and you do say this is who you are, are you really tapping into the resources of your faith? Are you living that out? Because I think Paul is asking us that question. And if, if it isn't, when you have to ask yourselves why. Why isn't it evident in our lives? Another way to look at this is um, that I was thinking about this week is has anybody thought, because of the Spirit's movement in your life, has anybody been not quite sure what to do with you? It's an interesting test to think about. Has anybody not been able to understand who you are? And it would be because of this combination of joy and directness and control that's contrasted for us here. All right, number one, that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Now, number two, then what's produced What is produced in a life this way? Well, if you go back to our text, the very first line, Paul says this phrase. He says, be careful how you live. And again, that that seems kind of bland to us. If you go to the Greek, he uses an image. He says, be careful how you walk. I actually like that better. It's a better translation. Because walking, the image is a process. It's a journey. And a journey to what? He says, be careful how you live. Do not be unwise, be wise. So there's something then about the process of gaining wisdom is a journey. It takes time. And this is an important point. Wisdom is not information. Wisdom is not content. It's the application of truth in any particular moment when the way forward is not necessarily clear. And the reason why this is an important point is is my experience over the past seven years of doing this church life with you all as New Yorkers, what I've seen the most from New Yorkers, many New Yorkers are experts in their field, and that you literally are paid because of your expertise of being a doctor or being a lawyer or being a paralegal or being whatever. You're paid because of the content of what you know. The problem with us is I think the way way I see us relate is then we implicitly think to be an expert in Christianity, I have to be that first before I can go out and love and serve and care and be involved in other people's lives. 
I, too many people think, oh, well, I don't, I can, who am I? I don't know what I can do. I can't do this. So people always say, but, but, but I, I don't want to get more maybe involved in community groups or the lives of other people because what if they see through me and can tell that I don't really know what I'm talking about? Or I don't want to get involved with my neighbor next door. I don't want to get involved with maybe other non-Christians because what if they ask me a, a theological question I can't understand? I see this over and over and over again, and I think it's one of the biggest barriers that this church has to being salt and light in this world is that I, I don't know if it's on purpose. It just seems like implicit. We hide behind. Or we don't really hide, but we don't feel like we ha- are empowered to go out because we don't feel like we're experts in our field. And yet I think this is why I say it a lot here, but it's no small thing that Jesus picked fishermen as his first disciples, which I'm positive they had no idea how the Trinity related when they went out to love and serve. I'm positive they didn't necessarily know how all the miracles, uh, how they actually worked. But notice it wasn't more content, and yet they still did. Famed Jewish Holocaust survivor, and psychiatrist uh, Viktor Frankl, he wanted to know why did some people survive the Holocaust and some people didn't? Why did some people survive the concentration camps and other people didn't? And what he wanted to know was maybe people who knew more content or had better fitness or uh, were smarter people, maybe those were the people who survived more. And what he found in his studies is that's not the case. That the answer wasn't any of those things. In fact, he found that if you put your life in anything that the Nazis could take away, like if you put your life into your career, if it was into your life, if it was into your smarts or the content in your head, and they would beat it out of you, because that's when you died. Instead, he found that those who had meaning beyond this world, a meaning that suffering could not take away, that's who survived. And it was the wisdom of applying that. A couple weeks ago, um, my fa- we did uh, my father's memorial service. Um, it was lovely, it was beautiful, but the day of, my brother, my older brother, he wasn't scheduled to actually speak, and he wrote out a prayer, and he said, I'd like to do this prayer. And um, he, was, he was asking me, should, we, should I do the prayer? And I said, you know, this is a beautiful prayer, but no offense, if you do this, you're gonna cry. And he's like, I don't think I will. I go, David, at my wedding 20 years ago, it was a happy moment, and you cried. You're going to cry at this one. It's going to happen. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yeah. And he goes, is that okay? And I said, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I hope you do. I hope that you do that because it would give people the cathartic space to be able to, to grieve. That's what's missing from this service. That Jesus, if you go to uh, the book of John, when Lazarus died, the, bro- the sisters of Lazarus, Mary, Martha, go, and, it, and it's, it's a, an important point that they say the exact same phrase to Jesus. If you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And he goes to Martha and he says, I am the way, the truth, and life. He gives her a Bible study. But when he goes to Mary, he just cries because that's the, what she needed. And what was so sweet was my brother knowing that he was going to probably cry. He gets up front and does that because it, it, was, the, it was wisdom. It wasn't content. It was just loving people and being present And that was enough. And that, I think, is what at least Paul is trying to get at when he says, be wise. Now, all right, fine, what's what's produced? Paul tells us in the the beginning, verse 19, that there are um, four present participles of what's produced. First, Paul says, speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Secondly, sing and make music from your heart. Thirdly, Give thanks to God for, for everything, and then fourthly, submit to one another. And what you need to see quickly, speaking to one another the, in, the, in the Greek, it's a horizontal thing. It's, not, it's to each other that we're speaking these things. And then singing, it's vertical. It says, it's not, it's, who are you singing to? He says, sing to the Lord. It's a vertical thing to, between us and the Creator. And then thirdly, giving thanks. For what? For some things? For that thing? No, it's to, for everything the good and the bad, as it all leads us to know him better. And then lastly, submit to one another. I, I, I think this, 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 we could do a whole sermon on just this little passage. What does it mean to submit to one another? It's a posture of saying, I'm not going to place myself over you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you, and I want you to place yourself over me. I want that posture. 
Back to that Spielberg movie, there's this really poignant scene when uh, Spielberg's mother is given reasons for why she's divorcing her husband, and she says this phrase. She says, do what your heart says you have to, so you don't owe anyone your life, not even to me. Do what your heart tells you. And I love that Spielberg put this in the movie because he understood that this is the articulation of the value that our culture lives by, and yet it was the very thing that was injuring him. And he had so much pain, you could see it, not just him, but in his sisters as well, that it, 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 it broke things down. It's the opposite of submitting to one another. She says, literally, not even to me, just follow your heart. And if this phrase, this narrative is in every single one of our stories. And yet, back up for a second then. What's the theme that runs through all four of the th- these things that are being produced in you, of speaking and singing and thanking and submitting? The theme that I see is that they are all manifestations of of what joy in Christ looks like. Secular culture will tell you that you, the way to deal with shame and guilt and anxiety is you need to empty your mind. There's all these, this new push of mindfulness practices. It's always empty your mind, which I think personally just makes you less human as you're, you're supposed to empty your mind. And yet, this is saying, no, fill your mind. Fill your mind with Jesus. And then speak those psalms and those hymns and sing and give thanks and submit. And if you did that, you would have more joy in the reverence of Christ. You say, oh, how's that possible? Go think about that reverence for Christ part. The world says get your esteem and your power and your joy. Right? You only live once, follow your heart, all that stuff. And yet, I think what Spielberg shows is that that means that we're just a bunch of people that are constantly hurting each other. As we fall in our hearts, when I follow my heart, I'm hurting your heart. Well, then as you're following your heart, you're hurting my heart. And that's the world we live in today. And yet this is saying, no, 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 if, if, you, if you get your esteem and your power and your joy by looking at Jesus, then the more you know who he is and what he's done, the more you let that reverence for Christ speak to your heart, you're going to give thanks, you're going to sing, you're going to submit to one another, it's gonna, you're going to be able to live in a world that nothing can take that away from you as you live out this love and care and service. I took my kids to um, an Arsenal game in the United Kingdom over the summer, and let me tell you something, that was a cultural experience, to go to a uh, soccer, a premier soccer game in the United Kingdom. You know what we found there? We found people speaking, we found people singing, there was a lot of chanting and, and uh, um, you know, songs about soccer, there was a lot of giving thanks for their team, there was even submission. People were going, oh, no, you walk by. Oh, no, 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 you walk by. And yet as the game went on, the songs got more slurred. <laughs> as there was more drinking, there was less speaking, more shouting, less giving things. As, as the game got more intense, as the hardship of the world of that game, as the outcome became more unsure, all those things started breaking down. There was less thanksgiving. There was less, there was less loving submission. What is so powerful, what, what Paul is saying is available to us is that if you're looking to Jesus in the situations where things get more intense and more, more hard and, and um, where circumstances are difficult, you don't slur. Your mind gets clearer as you start seeing what's really important in life and what's not. Right? You don't necessarily uh, get less joy. You realize there's actually more joy that's available than you thought there was. I've seen that personally just in the past couple months in my own life. Why? Because if you're designed by a creator, we said this earlier, and you are made in God's image, and God has all these attributes, and you're made in his image, and that means then there's something about you uniquely that reflects God that only you can reflect, which means all of us are love poems written to the world, to each other, by God. And the way we show that is by speaking and singing and giving thanks and submitting to one another. Are you doing that? Are you seeing that produced in your life? Right? A spirit-filled life has specifically that. A heart changed and rooted in the confidence of the grace that's received affects your life in this way and it spills out in joy. And I, and I can't put too fine a point on this, that it, you are not being asked, no matter what you believe, you're not being asked to just know more content, to have all the answers. The wisdom you will have will be the way that you sing and that you speak and that you give thanks and you submit as you, 
which will be very different than that person or that person or that person. That's what's produced. Okay, last point. That's all nice, fine and dandy, Michael. Thank you so much. But how do you actually have that? If we're not seeing that, if we're not seeing that evident, where do we get that? I think we have to come back to this text and come back to this point because it's Paul who's making the association that it's possible for you to have so much joy in your life that you might be confused as somebody who's might have drunk too much. And I want to know, what would that look like in my life if that was really evident? And I think the key is back in verse 20 when Paul says, give thanks for everything. I want you to make a pause and say, wait a second, what does he mean by it? Does he mean everything like the good and the bad? Go back to Paul's life. He did not have an easy life. He was shipwrecked. He was imp- wrongfully imprisoned. Right? He, he was uh, beaten. Death threats. How can you give thanks for absolutely everything that's come in your life? In 1882, the composer George Matheson wrote one of my favorite hymns, still is, Oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go. We sing it here sometimes. And he wrote that hymn on the night that his fiance abandoned him because it became known that he was going blind. And she didn't want to be married to somebody that was going to bring that hardship into her life. She didn't want to be around for that. And I, this week I've been trying to imagine what would it be like to be abandoned by the one person that you were supposed to spend the rest of your life with who was supposed to be there for you. And then when, it, when the going got tough, she left. And you know what he did? He wrote... And the first line he wrote was, Oh, love that will not let me go. Why? Because he knows all the other loves will let him go. But this love will not let him go. And then the next line, he uses all this imagery. Even though he's losing the physical ability to see these things, he says, O oh, joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain. And feel the promise is not vain, the morn shall tearless be. What I love is what he's doing. He is speaking and he's singing and he's giving thanks. And he's submitting to this, knowing that there is joy. Why? Because he's being sought after. Oh, love that will not let me go. Knowing that even though he was abandoned by her, he was not going to be abandoned by him. And while there's tears today, He knows that in the morning there won't be tears. I think this is what we have to speak and we have to sing because when we find our hearts saying, go to your version, if you feel like you're saying, I'll never be happy, I'll never find that one person, I'll never get that job, I'll never get, I'll never have back what was taken from me, that person, that place, that thing. Whatever that is, whatever the cry of your heart is, this is what you need to say. I'm gonna trace the rainbow through the rain. You know what I love about rainbows? Rainbows are just, it's just light refracted through a prism to see the beauty. You know that? It's just white light. White light is everywhere. That means there's rainbows everywhere right now that you just can't see. But they're there. And if we knew that and held on to the beauty of that promise, whatever the storm you might be in right now, we could see the, the color of his love being poured out into us and it will change everything. If you want to try to look at this in the negative for a second... If you want to look at your own actions, ask yourself, why do, why do I make dumb mistakes? Why do I get so easily angry, so easily frustrated? Why don't I obey God? Why don't I read my Bible? Why don't I pray? Why don't I want this stuff? At the end of the day, it, the, it, it, Paul is saying the answer is because you haven't made Jesus your joy. At some level, he's not really your joy. Maybe, maybe something else is. Something else is functioning that way. Maybe you know this truth in your head, but it hasn't made, become real in your heart. What you need to say is this. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was dead, but now I'm alive. I know this because, not because Jesus was lost. That's why I'm alive. Because Jesus was made dead, now that's why I can be made alive. And if you did that, you would see how that could create praise on your lips If you haven't done it recently, I ask you to make this prayer. Make this prayer. Thank you, Lord. I don't understand everything that's going on in my life. I don't know why this is happening. But I'm going to thank you for the light and the love. I'm going to thank you. I'm going to be able to trace the rainbow through the rain. And as you speak and as you say those things to each other and to him, out of reverence for Christ, you're going to see a life filled with joy. I would love us to be a church that's filled with the Spirit. I'd rather us be a filled with the Spirit church than a competent church. 
I'd rather us be a, a church that's filled with joy and contentment and this boldness combination of, of, of beauty and love and care, but, but self-secured and, and reserved, than being a competent one. And I think that's possible for us. And so the last question to ask yourself is, will you, will you do this? Will you, will you make this your commitment? Will you put yourself in the positions to be filled by the Holy Spirit by dwelling what Christ has done? And if we did, we would not ever want to miss an opportunity to praise, right? Why, why, we would never want to miss church. If church is the place where we have the opportunity to praise and love and give thanks and to remember and sing, that was real. We would never want to miss that. I know it falls right around the corner. For a lot of you, stuff speeds up. Some of it's already going. But I want you to ask yourself, how do, might I engage better here at Lincoln Square? How might I be able to engage back in my, in, in my workplace, in, in, my, in my life? Not because you have to, because you want to. To be filled with the Spirit it means to be filled with Christ as the Spirit is making him known to you. It's the key to joy. It's the key to everything else. I want us to make that love and assurance so centered in our life that we move out in these profound ways. Let's do that now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this truth. Thank you. I know that there is a mixed bag of, of how Christians have loved and cared in the world. I pray that we profoundly see the promises made to us in what you've done for us, Father, so we can be filled with the Spirit to see what's produced out into our lives in profound and special ways. Father, um, help us know that it's not about having it all put together or having all the right answers. You're just asking us to be ourselves where we can confidently move forward knowing that as we learn more about ourselves and our issues and uh, we, we, we see more of your grace and love and as we see more of your grace and love it gives us the freedom to look more at ourselves and our issues. And the power is the combination of holding those together. I pray we'd be a people that see that as a journey. See wisdom as the process of learning more and more about that and then applying it to our lives wherever we go. I pray these things in your name. Amen.